Thief 1 and 2 are my favorite games of all time. I didn't grow up with them, in fact, I discovered the series in the mid-2010s, and these two games really stuck with me. Part of the reason is that they are both excellent and still hold up for the most part, but I wouldn't be playing them for nearly half a decade at this point if it wasn't for all the fan-made content on offer. Thief mods, or fan missions, contain some of the best Thief content I've experienced, sometimes better than what was in the original games. All these years later, these games have one of the most dedicated and passionate communities out there. So how did it all begin? What were the major events that shaped the modern scene? And why does the community still make levels for games that are over 20 years old at this point? In today's video, I'll provide a brief retrospective of Thief Modding. Our story begins right here, through the Looking Glass forums, or TTLG for short. While today it is known as a place for all things Thief-related, TTLG predates Thief, and it was originally created to follow all Looking Glass's projects, such as Ultima Underworld and System Shock. The history is a bit vague on how or when, but eventually several Looking Glass developers joined the forums, sharing updates and announcements, so now the fans could engage them in a conversation. And then, Thief the Dark Project came out. Originally, the game had no mod support, and Looking Glass had no plans to release its level editor either. However, not even half a year later, the fans created a petition for Looking Glass to reconsider. Gathering over a thousand signatures, it succeeded. On April 14th, 1999, Looking Glass secretly supplied two TTLG members with a copy of Dramat, the level editor for Thief, and a challenge – make something worthwhile, and the editor will be released to the public. Six weeks later, on May 27th, they did just that. So what was the mission that convinced Looking Glass amateurs can also make levels? Gathering at the bar, made by Trimfect, was a simple break-in mission with the goal of stealing several items. Visually, it was about on par with the original missions. It also had a video briefing and a really well-made map. The only area where Gathering was clearly inferior to the original missions was its iffy sound propagation and a complete lack of an ambient soundscape. Still, it was good enough for Looking Glass to release drama to the public when they received an early beta of the mission from Trimfect. This is why, when looking at the first missions ever released, you'll notice that Gathering isn't technically the first, as it was still being polished before going public, while in the meantime, Others were already eager to try out Dramat and release their own creations. When Thief Gold came out, apart from the three new missions we all know and love, it now also came with a copy of Dramat, and documentation on its use written by Looking Glass, and so did Thief 2. Although Looking Glass sadly closed its doors shortly after Thief 2's release, now the fans had everything they needed to keep Thief content coming. It quickly became apparent that Thief lends itself really well to fan-made missions, as the world established by the original games was flexible enough to allow the authors to tell their own stories without it feeling at odds with the ones Looking Glass told. The early fan missions were mostly similar to the original ones. While they weren't mind-blowing, I'm sure many veteran Thief players would have fond memories of visiting Lord Edmund's Manor in Lord Edmund and the Tains, or raiding the haunted Bloodstone prison in the mission of the same name. At the same time, many authors were already trying new and creative things not seen in Thief before. Equilibrium, for example, pitted you against a group of keepers who have the same powers as you do. If you ever wondered why guards have such a hard time seeing Garrett when he's in the shadow, here is your answer. There was also quite a bit of work being done outside of Dramat. The very first missions had to be played by manually placing all the associated files into a thief directory, which was quite cumbersome. To make this process easier, mission launcher Thief Loader and a little later Dark Loader were created. Dark Loader was the fan mission launcher of choice for over a decade. It's not anymore, but I'll get to that later. Active knowledge sharing also characterized this early period. Authors were eager to learn how the editor works, so they actively documented all their findings, creating numerous guides and tutorials. Probably the most important contributor in this regard was Comag, who created a beginner's guide to Dramat and helped many new authors get to grips with the editor. And now, it wouldn't be long before the community would see some of the most important fan missions ever being released. The first mission that really shaped the scene was, in my opinion, a Seventh Crystal by Saturnine, which came out in 2001. It is known for featuring the first ever in game cutscene, known as a Camvator, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I do want to focus on are two distinct transited sets the set of a mansion that houses Dark Secret and a key hunt mission structure. In the 2000s, the most popular mission type was a mansion heist. 
It is not too surprising, since the original games, especially Thief 2, laid a solid foundation for this. But it was the seventh Crystal's way of making a mansion heist a story-driven experience that stuck for many years to come. Quite a few of these missions featured skeletons in the closet, sometimes quite literally, and their stories were filled with conspiracies. Many of these mansions also featured haunted crypts or other surprises beneath them. It even became an inside joke in the community after a while. Is it so hard to find a mansion in the city without a haunted crypt or a lost temple under it? The other thing that became popular after the seventh crystal was a key hunt mission structure. If you're unfamiliar with the term, it refers to the player having to find keys in a specific order to make progress. Now, I would like to clarify that the mission being a key hunt isn't necessarily a bad thing. There absolutely are missions, most notably story-driven ones, that benefit from being structured this way. At least when it's done right. And there were many missions, not necessarily mansion heist ones, which adopted such design and ran with it. The 2000s were a great time for those who like Robin Victorian mansions and immersing themselves into mystery. But there was one mission that was even more influential than Saturnine's creation. The year is 2002 and the author known as Pura releases Calendra's Legacy. Where do I even begin with this behemoth? If you were to ask some random thief fan about which fan mission they consider the most important, there is a good chance this will be the one they name. But what did it do exactly? It didn't set any specific trends like the Seventh Crystal did. Instead, its influence was a bit more subtle, but a lot more profound. Calendra's Legacy isn't just one mission. It is a campaign comprised of three missions, each of them being pretty large and featuring lots of custom content, numerous scripted sequences, and some big surprises. Its second mission, Midnight in Merkbell, is the centerpiece of the campaign, starting off deceptively simple, but quickly turning into a war zone, as hordes of the undead erupt throughout the city. Now, this wasn't the first time that Thief players saw custom graphics or elaborate scripting. Hell, in Calendra's Sister, the prequel to this, Pura already pushed the boundaries of what can be accomplished in a fan mission not to mention the Seventh Crystal and a few other highly impressive missions that came before. However, these themes were never done on such scale. You see, what Calendra's Legacy did was raise the bar for the quality of custom Thief content across the board. It was massive, it was epic, and it was easily the most ambitious fan creation up to that point. Now other fan mission authors had to work even harder to impress their players, and they did. They didn't try to repeat what Calendra's Legacy did. They tried to do their own thing as good as Calendra's Legacy did. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that every fan mission that followed was so monstrous in scale, however. Most authors still kept close to what was done in the original games, but the average quality of releases and the ambitions of mission authors kept rising. They now felt freer to experiment and strive to surprise their players. Should I also mention that Pura got a job as a level designer soon after? Well, I guess I just did. He and several other former Thief Mothers are now working in the games industry. These days, Calendra's legacy is often criticized, with quite a few players, including yours truly, claiming that it hasn't aged all that gracefully. Whether that's true or not, I highly respect what it did for the modern scene, and its legacy is still evident today. When it comes to influential missions, there is another release I have to talk about. This one is a bit more subjective, as if my first two picks aren't, but I do believe it shaped the scene in the 2010s as much as the Seventh Crystal did in the 2000s. This mission is Disorientation by Malan. Disorientation is a large city mission, taking its inspiration from the Dark Project as well as Pura's creations. Now, a city mission wasn't anything new at the time, and it wasn't even Malan's first attempt at such mission type. However, no other city mission before this was so... vertical. Disorientation was the first true city sandbox, inspiring a number of authors to create similar missions. Many of them were similar in style to Disorientation, but even those that weren't emphasized exploration and verticality. As a result, there weren't nearly as many mentioned missions in the 2010s as there were before. On the other hand, city missions started to come out much more frequently, and they still remain the most popular mission type among players. It'll be interesting to see if this persists throughout another decade. However, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Disorientation came out in 2009, but I want to talk about a couple of releases that came before. While they may not have been as influential, they were still quite remarkable. 
The closure of Looking Glass in the year 2000 was devastating to the fans. Nobody knew if they'd see another Thief game, and even if they did, it was never going to be the same. There was a saving grace, however. By this time, fans were already relatively experienced with Dromid, and they soon decided to honor the legacy of Looking Glass by creating a full-on expansion for Thief 2. Thief 2X Shadows of the Metal Age is a 13-mission campaign that feels almost like a brand new Thief game. The production value is incredible. The game has briefings for every mission, several cutscenes, a number of fully voiced characters that replaced the original ones, and lots of other custom content. With over 60 contributors, it was a true community project. Its quality might not be as high as that of the original games, but the sheer ambition behind the project is staggering. However, while Thief 2X was met with really warm reception when it came out in 2005, it has since been criticized more and more for reasons such as the quality of its assets, its story, and its main character, which I think is a bit unfair. It seems that because Thief 2X feels like another Thief game, and has been covered in a number of gaming publications over the years, it is also held to a higher standard than standalone fan missions. Yes, the quality of assets isn't as consistent as in the original games. Yes, the story of Thief 2X is quite simple. And yes, Zaya, the new protagonist, isn't nearly as strong of a character as Garrett. But Thief 2X is more than the sum of its parts, and the author's passion for the project is obvious. To this day, it remains one of the crowning achievements of the community. If you've never played a fan mission before and want to get into it, this is definitely where you should begin. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the Dark Mud as well. Now, I know this is a bit out of place, as the Dark Mud is something completely separate from Thief Mudden. However, if I don't talk about it here, I doubt I would ever make a separate video, and I do feel like it deserves a spotlight. Thief Deadly Shadows received mixed reviews when it came out. Many fans of the first two games were disappointed with the size of its levels and its movement, that no longer featured rope climbing and swimming. Around this time, several individuals started to toy with the idea of a game that had the technical fidelity of Deadly Shadows, but did it make the compromises required for it to work on consoles. Deadly Shadows wasn't very mother-friendly either, and there was only a handful of fan missions made for it. The Dark Mud developers decided to use the Doom 3 engine, since at the time it was the best and really the only available option for making such a game. It had dynamic shadows and ragdoll physics, just like Deadly Shadows, but more importantly it provided robust modding tools and was easy to modify the hell out of. Still, many things had to be coded from scratch. Doom 3's AI, for example, wouldn't really work in a stealth game, so it had to be completely redone. With that, it took about three years until the first Dark Mod demo, Thief's Den, saw the light of day. In 2009, the Dark Mod was released as a Doom 3 mod, and a few years later as a completely free standalone game. The reception of the Dark Mod was... lukewarm. It was somewhere along the lines of, eh, that's cool, but it's not a replacement for Thief. Part of the reason is that the early versions of the mod were quite rough. They didn't have a stable frame rate, there were crashes, and overall it felt clunkier than Thief. Nevertheless, it found its dedicated audience, and it's still being actively developed to this day. The Dark Mod doesn't have an official campaign, and most of its missions are standalone. The game does come with three pre-installed missions, and if you're new to it, I'd recommend playing the training mission and a new job to begin with. The Tears of Saint Lucia is a major difficulty spike, however, and you might want to come back to it once you have a bit more experience with the Dark Mod. Play Full Moon Fever or Volta and the Stone instead, these are much better for beginners. I first played the Dark Mod when it was already pretty polished and found it to be a lot of fun. Sure, it's not a replacement for Thief, but it's not like playing one means you can never play the other. If you tried the Dark Mod years ago and dropped it because of the bugs or the game feel, give it another shot. It plays much better these days. And if you're new to it, I would recommend treating it as its own game. You're not supposed to play it the same way you play Thief. You will need to learn the game and get adjusted to it. And frankly, the fact that it was able to provide me with a familiar yet new stealth experience was exactly what made it so appealing to me. I would also be remiss if I didn't talk about the amazing New Dark patch. On September 24th, 2012, a small archive was posted on a French Thief forum by an anonymous author, who, by the way, remains anonymous to this day. This archive made a game compatible with modern operating systems, allowed it to run in widescreen without much hassle, and contained a bunch of improvements for Dramat. It seemed almost too good to be true at first, with some even thinking it's a prank. 
Once this shock wore off, however, every Thief player, and especially fan mission author, felt like a kid on Christmas. New Dark made Dromit much more comfortable to work with. While it didn't outright lift any of Dromit's limitations, it increased them dramatically. Probably the biggest deal is the poly count. Before, the engine only allowed 1024 polygons in view. With New Dark, you can have up to 20,000. It also made portalization, or generating world geometry, much faster, and made Dromit less prone to crashing, which, allegedly, used to happen a lot back in the day. New Dark also made playing fan missions easier through its built-in fan mission selector, or FMSL for short. Later, new mission launchers New Dark Loader and Angel Loader made Dark Loader, which hadn't been updated for years at that point, completely obsolete. New Dark is certainly the most significant patch the Thief games ever got, but it's not the only one. After it came out, it was promptly integrated into Thiefix and Tefer Patcher, both of which had already existed and aimed at fixing bugs in Thief 1 and 2, respectively. These days, however, Tefer Patcher is also obsolete and superseded by T2Fix. Unfortunately, by the time New Dark came out, many authors who were active in the 2000s had moved on, and the number of missions released each year was already dwindling. New Dark did bring some new blood into the community, but it couldn't reverse this trend. But while the quantity of missions went down, their quality began increasing as never before. The 2010s saw the release of the most ambitious fan missions ever, in large part because missions of such scope were simply not possible before. Most of my personal favorites are New Dark missions, specifically those from a couple of contests that were held at TTLG. Ah yes, the contests. One more thing I want to cover before wrapping up. The contest tradition exists for nearly as long as Thief Modern does. The very first contests were held in the early 2000s by Comac, and he's responsible for popularizing the format. The idea behind pretty much every contest was a relatively strict time limit and a central theme, although the early contests had done. These limitations were meant to level the playing field, and Comac actively encouraged those new to Dramat to participate. Interestingly, though, contests also ended up being a great venue for veteran authors, who could show off their skills in small, experimental missions. The two 20th anniversary contests are worth a special mention. The Dark Project 20th anniversary contest, held in 2018, was the first time that participants had an entire year to make their missions. The only other limitation was the adherence to stock resources, though it was still allowed to modify them. This way, authors could focus on building their missions rather than searching for or creating assets. The result was mind-blowing. 23 new releases, quite a few of which were instant classics. This was easily the most successful contest ever, and the biggest event in the community since the release of New Dark. The F2 20th anniversary contest of 2020 had pretty much the same rules, and while it didn't yield as many missions, it was still a moderate success. Contests is where you will find the most bizarre and oddball fan missions ever. While they aren't always good missions in a traditional sense, they are definitely some of the most creative and memorable ones. So what's next? Well, currently there is a new Dark Anniversary contest going on, which should hopefully bring with it some excellent missions. There are also a couple of large campaigns in development, which the entire community is looking forward to. And there is a more modern level editor being developed, called the FM Editor. While I don't believe Dramat will become obsolete anytime soon, the FM Editor does look promising. Of course, nothing can last forever, and the golden age of fan missions is undoubtedly behind us. But as of now, I remain optimistic about the future of Thief Martin. Now if you'll excuse me, all this fan mission talk makes me want to go and fire one up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around!